Welcome to the All About You podcast. My name is Sheila and I am your host. In this podcast, I invite people to tell their stories of their travels, hobbies and passions. These podcasts are also now available on my All About You YouTube channel. So if you have a story to tell, please contact me on allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and let's tell your story. Welcome to another conversation on the All About You podcast. And today I have a returning guest and my guest is Tom. Now Tom is a voice actor and he's back on the podcast today, but we're talking about his passion, typewriters. Tom, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be back. Thank you. Typewriters. I don't think I've ever come across anybody before who collects typewriters. And we are sitting here looking at a spreadsheet with 23 typewriters. <laughs> How did this obsession with typewriters start? Well, in the last podcast, I spoke of my friend Sean, who got me into voice acting. It's also his fault that I have all these typewriters. He had me come over one day. We're just hanging out at his apartment. And we watched this documentary with Tom Hanks about typewriters on HBO. And whatever reason it inspired me, because I always liked books and writing and, you know, fan of Tom Hanks movies and films. It's like, oh, I went down to the little antique shop and picked up a little Remington typewriter. It was some 1956 standard. They made millions of these things. So, oh, it's cheap. It was like $25. And I, I picked it up. It worked perfect. And it was really cool. And then I went antiquing some more. And then came back with like two. And because they were like 25 and 50. And then... Before I knew it, I was on eBay. It, it was like I needed an intervention. It was uh, antiquing, Craigslist. And before I knew it, I, I even picked up one on my way to Colorado when I visited my brother-in-law, you know, and brought it all the way back to Kansas City and ended up with 23 typewriters. Now, not all of them at the time were fully functional and I ended up learning how to service and fix almost every one of them in some capacity, even if they didn't need it, because I would take them down, clean them, put them back together and all these things. I blame Tom Hanks for my obsession. It became an obsession of collecting one from every decade since the standardized typewriter and I completed that task from the year 1908 through the year 1977. And that's where they all range. And all but one is a manual typewriter. There's one electric. And they all function now. I've used them all. My friend Sean joked with me. He was saying, what on earth are you going to do? Because at the time it was 27. What are you going to do with almost 30 typewriters? What is the matter with you? I mean, I get it. People collect things, but they're not small. They take up a lot of space. And he's like, and nobody really uses those anymore. So I hadn't written anything in a long time. And I said, well, you know what? Here's what I'll do. He was moving to Florida and we were going to be moving to Spain. And I said, I will write you one letter a week for a year to justify these typewriters and I'll use every and I will use every single typewriter at least once to write you a letter and it was like yeah right sure whatever and I did and the next year I wrote one every month and then one every month after that and it ended up being short stories instead so this typewriter obsession turned into a writing thing because Quite frankly, it was so boring. The first letter was like, hey, this is what we did this week. How was your week? I said, well, that's boring. So I just started making up stories and doing fun things with the typewriters where me, my wife, and 
my friend Sean and his wife are all characters in the stories, you know, just goofy things and fun things. And just had fun with creative writing. And I blame again Tom Hanks and Sean for doing that. And uh, I learned so much about typewriters. And to me, it's more like history, you know, and the fascination that something as old as a hundred years mechanically still functions perfectly to this date to create if you wanted a book there's something very tactile about using a typewriter because they all sound different and the pressure and it's psychologically so much intent when hitting a letter you know to make a word the creative process is so different because when using a typewriter you don't get a squiggly blue line telling you that maybe you've chosen the wrong word or a red one trying to autocorrect what you've typed. There's no erasing. So you have complete freedom of creative thought without any interruption, without anything to remotely distract your chain of thought, which may have nothing to do with anything. But the nice thing is I've, I've written these stories and come back and said, oh, that one little five word phrase that I gave up on for the rough, rough draft ended up being a whole nother story, you know, so you never know. Because if I'd done that on a computer, I would have deleted it or it would have been erased. Okay, if we go back to that first antique shop, when you saw that typewriter, what was it? Was it, it's a thing of beauty? Is it, it's a piece of history? Is it, oh, okay, I've been thinking about writing a book. Maybe if I buy a typewriter that bought me on the book. What was it that first, <sighs> that first intrigue of the typewriter? The very first thing was when I was a child, we had an electric typewriter, a little Smith Corona electric typewriter with this little cartridge. You know, growing up, I'd always had to use a typewriter. Then I gave up on it. I wanted to start writing again. And I enjoyed it. I've been writing using a fancy pen, you know, fountain pens and things about our travels, you know, that we'd started together, my wife and I, when we started traveling around the world. And it wasn't just the history. It was the history of it, which fascinated me, you know. It was also... I don't know, I guess I held a very romantic view. You see these photos of Hemingway with his typewriter and all these famous authors are pictured with their typewriter there. So it was a bit romantic, but there was this art to it in my mind as well. The simplicity of the mechanics, you know, because I'm an, I was an IT engineer. It was like a piece of art to me. There were all these little pieces that were very simple. It's just pulleys and springs and, you know, levers. You put it all together and it creates this thing that not only is pretty and beautiful to look at, but can create something beautiful to read at the same time, you know. I can certainly understand sort of the romantic side of a typewriter. There's a Jessica Lansbury, a very, very famous actress, obviously no longer with us, unfortunately, had a very, very successful career playing a, a female detective in Murder, She Wrote. And the opening scene is she's at her typewriter in the film with Colin Firth. Uh, I think it was Love Actually. He goes away to, to write his book. So he's sitting there, this beautiful like, French villa, and he, he develops his story. And it's the romance of the typewriter. So I can certainly see how typewriters can be perceived as romantic. And I think as well, we've often got views of back in the day, the typing pool in an office. All right. these girls sitting there tapping away and then putting the covers at the end of the day, the dust covers over the typewriters. You know, there's that nostalgia, there's that romance. It's 
you know, oh, if I have a typewriter, maybe I'll actually sit and write the book and everything. So I certainly understand about the romance side of things. Yeah, and it, there's something about the uh, the little ding at the end when you come to the end and you physically move the 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 platen as it's called back and you know get to start the next line and clickety clack as you're doing it it's very sensory it is it? It it's is. not like a keyboard now a lot of people are using keyboards on ipads you get no sound it's not as romantic as the click clack and the ribbon and the ding and you know all those little things it's quite a nostalgic sound yes isn't it it is i i actually traveled with it i i took one as a gift to my friend Sean in Florida from Kansas City. And I, I carried it with, through the airport on the plane. And I also did this when traveling while I was writing letters. I used the typewriter I have in my hand here while traveling to type the letters. In Spain, I took it all over with me, this silly little thing, much to my wife's chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fascinating because every single time... I was stopped at airport security, not because something was wrong, but because they would gather around the x-ray machine and me and have me open it, not out of a security question, but they were so fascinated that none of them had ever seen in real life a typewriter. Mm -hmm. And they were just amazed. They were like calling their buddies over from the security to look at the x-ray, look at this. And they was like, wow, it really works, blah, blah, blah. And it was very funny to travel with a typewriter around because security agents just I guess were like children at a museum you know they were just fascinated I think that's an interesting thing though isn't it probably a lot of people now have never seen a real typewriter they might have seen it in the film or on the tv right but a physical typewriter and to touch it and maybe press the keys it's like wow what's this it's, it's, it's not the same romance with a computer is there absolutely not. no no it's not quite the same and don't get me wrong after I've done rough drafts, I will write on a computer because <laughs> it's very difficult to get it perfect otherwise. But the initial drafts and sometimes even second and thirds I'll do on the typewriter. And there, there's just, again, something about the sound. And if we look back, it's like carbon copies of things. Yes. Yeah. And what were those little things if you did make an error? There was like a typewriter rubber, a circular rubber, I seem yes, to remember. Yes, yeah, there's a circular little uh, erasing. It's, yeah. it's basically an eraser. Yeah, that's um, it. And rubber for us, eraser for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, they're used to, with a little, it was a wheel with a little yeah. brush on the end. And that's I, it. I have, I have so a few all of those. these little things that were part of the everyday equipment, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. you had your work to be done basically on the left-hand side. You then put it in your typewriter, did your thing, and then you put it in the out basket. I mean, that is just so romantic. I'm sure people who were secretaries back in the day wouldn't class that as romantic. No, not at all. And they would probably, if you <coughs> were a secretary then look at how offices work now where everything is autocorrect and you email everything. I mean, back in the day, if you had said to somebody using a typewriter, no, back in the 50s, in the future, this is how it, they would have just thought you were something from another planet. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, our phones are little mini yeah, computers. absolutely. So let's have a look at this sure. spreadsheet here. So we've got your spreadsheet. So you've got the brand, the model, the year. Serial numbers, colours, keys, typeset, case, where it was made, the font, any notes, and how much you paid for typewriters. So let's just have a quick look through here. On your spreadsheet, we're going from 1908 through to 1977. There's nothing past 1977. Does this mean your collection is complete? Yes. Right, your wife is going to be very happy to hear that. She, you're stopping at 23. She's the one that said my collection is complete. Right, okay. I can understand <laughs> that because they do take up a fair bit of space. So I'm with your wife on yeah, that yes. one. But there are a few that are quite notable. There's many that I have that were just whimsical purchases. But there's a few that are quite interesting and unique. There's this Underwood Model 5, the 1908, just because it's the oldest. And the little Corona 3 that's from 1919 because it's got 
or three characters per key versus the standard two. And the other one that I'm quite excited about is this, it's a, a 1964 Smith Corona Galaxy. And what's unique about that is that the font is script, as in cursive. And so, interestingly, all the letters, regardless of what you type, connecting together, just as you would handwriting, it's a unique type of font, and they didn't make very many, and it was designed for the housewife back in the day, back in the 60s, to type her friends for social events. I love that. I mean, how romantic is that, that I need a typewriter with a different font so I can do my social correspondence? Right. And it's that really is so, so more romantic than sending a, a WhatsApp message or, a, or an email, you know, come to my house for dinner. Absolutely. And they made them in fun colors like this one has to be, happens to be uh, sea mist blue, as Smith Corona called it. Ah, there's a Royal Futura 800. And it's got a very unique typeset because, interestingly, so the legend goes, when Bill Gates was trying to figure out what font to use for his very first computer, interactive one for his Mac OS, where, there were, where you use a mouse and everything, he was trying to decide, well, he needs a unique look, or something different than what you would see in the normal typewriter. Well, he was inspired by that particular typewriter's typeset because it has that sort of computer-like looking font, and it was very unique, and it's what inspired him to create the font for what became the first Mac computer. That is fascinating. <laughs> One thing I'm interested in, looking at the spreadsheet, you've got a column for keys. Some of the keys you've got as glass black, glass white, and then you've got Bakelite, green and black. Now, I remember Bakelite being used for the old dial telephones back in the day. Yes. We're sounding very old here, Tom. Yes, I know. We're aging ourselves, aren't we? Talking about Bakelite time, but we are aging ourselves. So this was the same Bakelite, used for some of the keys and we're talking here sort of the 1950s and then on to the 1960s and 70s same bakelite used for telephones was used for computer keys correct i don't know if they what they made bakelite or bakelite for originally but i yeah. don't even know what bakelite is uh, it's, yeah it's a fun little plastic it is a hard plastic it's a very very hard durable plastic and they used it for everything back then but Obviously, it was a less expensive option when you're mass producing these things. You know, in the 50s and 60s, all these were extremely mass produced. Prior to the war, World War II, it was like basically after World War II, they just mass produced every. They were mainly just business use, and there might be a few in the office. So they made the keys out of glass and metal. So they would have a glass little circle casing uh, of metal then that would be the key printed in it. So the other column I want to look at here is we've got the typeset. So we've got US typeset, British and Spanish. What do we mean by typeset? Okay, keyboards, as you even today, when you buy, a say, a computer in Spain, it will have the Enya on it. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. if you buy a computer in France it'll have some extra odd characters so it's going to have sim right. symbols for yeah those maybe countries. a few different things yeah. here and there and back then they did the same thing so what that means is the US one is your standard US keyboard quattro keyboard as we call it which prior to 1908 in the 1900s there wasn't a standard keyboard you know they were all over the place so the Quattri keyboard was invented finally and became the accepted standard, right? And so there are still slight differences. So the British typeset has a British pound sign, whereas the U.S. keyboard would have a dollar sign. So it's just small little nuances that I've noted uh, for the typeset. And then there's the two that have changeable characters so 
Smith Corona in the 70s, this, this uh, scientist, he was writing a paper. He said, you know, this is really difficult. All these scientists were writing these things and we need something with symbols because they didn't have computers to type their papers. And you can't hand write it when you're making a book. So, well, we need all these special symbols and characters. So Smith Corona designed a typewriter that had two keys where you could change the characters that you typed so that you could do math and physics or any specialty that you had. And it would change not just the little cover to go over the key on the typewriter, but also let you change out the little face, the little uh, striker that hit the paper. So you could interchange them for whatever symbols you wanted. That is fascinating, isn't it? So they were using a, what was the standard keyboard during the day, but that just didn't work for what they were trying to do. Right. So something was designed to actually make it easier for them to do that job. Right. That's incredible. And I have three different sets, one for accounting, one for math, and one for uh, international language, as they called it on the on the little case. The other thing I want to have a look at is you've got the column for case, and we've got things like black leather, brown leather, black plastic. So the cases for typewriters, and if we talk about the small, I guess domestic typewriters or the portable. Yeah, the portable ones. They call them portable. Yeah. Some of them don't look that portable. I mean, I think back, you know, when we saw see scenes of like the office, they've got this gigantic industrial type, right, where the girls can really bang, right. bang, bang through the keys. But black leather cases. So as well as having the typewriter, you had this beautiful leather case to keep it in. Correct. With little accessories some of them might have as well. And a manual possibly or... You know, whatever little gadgets they might throw in. Some of them came with the little rubber wheel and with the brush. Yeah, you know, absolutely. things like this. Let's talk about with the typewriter, your typing, and rather like your printer at home, it runs out of ink, it runs out of paper. Your typewriter would get to the end of the ink ribbon spool. Right. So changing an ink ribbon spool uh, was a horrendous job. We are so aging ourselves here, aren't we? But it was just the messiest job ever. It never went in easy. I mean, these days we just open up the lid of our printer, take out a cartridge, open right. the box and slot the other one in and hopefully off you go. It wasn't like that back in the day. No. Luckily, most, well, all the typewriters had a little mechanism where you could switch direction. So you could continually use the ribbon until it got to be faded. Just like, you know, you take that laser printer cartridge, shake it to get that extra yep, few we've pages all done out. That. But yes, I would have to buy the ribbons on the internet. And then you have to hand spool, connect them, run them through the little, you know, wheels and gadgets like feeding the ribbon through so it'll hit the paper properly and then wrap it around the other side and your hands just get full of black ink. And I'm thinking of like the typewriter ribbons where you have the black and the red. Yes. Did they originally only have black? They did. Originally it was only black and red. And then as they started to move to more business use in offices and things, even in the early 20s, you know, uh, to use it for accounting or things like that. They would use the red, became a, a popular one because of that reason. Mm. You know, when it started to become common in offices for financial statements and, and keeping accounting records so that they could have something was in the, in the red, so to speak. Okay. Are we saying then that typewriters were originally designed for sort of the, the home market and then they moved into offices or? Quite the opposite. They were originally designed because of their cost. Right. And they were new and people were like, well, why would I pay all that money? Because they weren't inexpensive. They were rather pricey up until after World War II. They weren't the most inexpensive thing to buy. So most people didn't have one. Now, a business could afford one, and it would make their productivity better for the secretaries and accountants and people like this. And so they originally, much like computers, started at the office and then migrated, especially after World War II, 
to the home because they needed to figure out a way to use all these facilities that they'd made for machining guns and things like this for the war. Well, Remington, as an example, was one of the companies that was huge in the 50s for making typewriters. They made millions of them. Well, they already had all these gun manufacturing in place and the ability to machine their own parts at a highly cost-effective manner. So they ended up manufacturing most of the parts for other typewriter companies because they had the facilities as a gun manufacturer to do so and ended up making some of their own typewriters as well. So for them, it was an easy transition Correct. to go from making guns to making typewriters. typewriters. And Remington is, I guess, one of the biggest typewriter companies. Well, they were mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, they were big in the office. And then they marketed it to the home to say, hey, you should have one at home. You're, you've got college started to become more popular. More people started going to university and... They started having typing classes in schools, and so people started having typewriters at home to write letters and things like this. So we've literally gone the, the same route, haven't we? Typewriters were a, a business machine, then they went into the home. Computers, in theory, started in the business workplace, then went into the home. So it's basically followed the thread, but the computer has got more sophisticated. We've got rid of the ribbon. We've now got a palette of, of colors and a palette of fonts and sizes. And you can drive yourself crazy in, you know, designing your own absolutely scheme of, of working. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about your column of notes. Where are you finding these typewriters? <laughs> Well, there was an antique section back in Kansas City called the uh, East Bottoms. And every weekend they had built these old buildings, old warehouses, were floors of different vendors of antiques. And that's where I started. I got some on Craigslist, Reddit, eBay, and then sometimes at a garage sale, I, I got a few. Somebody had an estate sale, you know, especially... I know it sounds horrible, but I would look at the newspaper and say, oh, person that was, you know, 90 passed away and they're having an estate sale. Good chance they might have a typewriter. And I wouldn't tell my wife what I was doing because she's, you're not going to get another typewriter, are you? I'm like, oh, probably not. No. And then come back with two. You know, she loved that. Are you absolutely adamant now that you are not going to add to your typewriter collection? I am. I am. I found over the course of time that there were very specific ones that I enjoyed using more than others. And I guess now I'm trying to sell them. I've given a few away to friends and uh, they're beautiful and I want other people to appreciate them. You know, I've appreciated them. I've enjoyed them a great deal. And my wife was quite right. Most of these are going to just sit there and collect dust. And to me, typewriters work best when they're used. The, the continuous use keeps all the parts from getting rusted and things like that. And she, was, she talked reason into me and said, uh, you can keep a few. Why don't you just keep three? And we negotiated it down to about seven typewriters now. <laughs> keep out of the 23 <laughs> but yes i'm working on either selling or giving the balance of those away because again there's just there's just so many i mean i think if we look at it you've had your romance with the typewriters you've actually got down to like who are your favorites now and you are prepared to send those others to a new home for someone else to appreciate them, and then maybe they will pass them on. Correct. I can't imagine anyone doing this with a laptop or a MacBook somehow. No. They no. just go to the graveyard. In yeah, they the go sky, to the bin. They, they go to the refuse. Pile. So there is no romance whatsoever with it with a computer like there is with a typewriter. I really have no attachment to computers in the same fashion. Even though I grew up, obviously, at the birth of the home computer, I just don't have that same attachment to it the thing with a typewriter is when you type it on a piece of paper it's permanent it doesn't go away i feel very romanticized about the written word but i'm a, a 
incredible fan of English literature. And I just find it fascinating that once you put something down on paper, it's there forever. I think it's quite fascinating if we look at the standard keyboard of 26 letters, how many songs, poems, plays, books, articles come out of 26 letters. It is quite incredible, isn't it? It, it is. And know that the vast majority of 100, almost 100 years of literature were created on a typewriter. To me, and it still can be, all these 23 are fully functional and able to be used. I don't know. I, I feel very lucky and I feel like I'm touching history when I use like the Underwood that's from 1908. I just imagine in my mind what other people use this and what for and where. It's over 100, it's 110 years old what hands have touched this typewriter and that's sort of how i feel every time i use one that's older like that is who worked on this what may have been written with this oh my god i think that is just absolutely fabulous it's just i'm using a piece of equipment who and what has gone before on using this machine that yeah. is absolutely fantastic and and to know that if taken care of properly with minimal effort quite frankly it might still be able to be used a hundred years from now quite easily. I must admit, I do like the thought when I'm reading a book, this book has been written and bashed out on a typewriter as opposed to click clacked out on a, on a MacBook or something like that. It's not the same romance, isn't it? It's interesting having this conversation. We keep talking about the romance of a typewriter whether it's things that have been written, how they were designed, the lifestyle back in the day. There's a lot of romance to there, a typewriter. There is, and, and it's not just the literature part, like I mentioned before, the engineering, the mechanics, and the design. And they're all a bit different. You know, I have some made in West Germany, and they run as smooth as the day they were made. And the Remingtons still run perfectly, and they all feel a bit different when you type with them. They all strike a bit different. You different pressures that you must put on different typewriters. And it's just, uh, they're quite personal. They're each unique and they have their own feel and, and characteristics. You know, they're their own personality. Each one of them are. <laughs> I think this has been absolutely fascinating conversation, Tom. I mean, I have learned so much about the world of typewriters. And, and I just think it's fantastic. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast and taking it on us into the romantic world of the typewriter. Well, you're quite welcome. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please subscribe on whatever platform you are using. It is free. And if you would like to tell your story, please contact me on allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and let's tell your story.